This is Robert Rocco Catoni, and I'm a professor at the University of Missouri St. Louis in the Department of Educational Sciences and Professional Programs in the College of Education. I uh, decided to try to record a lecture on radical social constructivism. Radical social constructivism is a topic that is garnering lots of attention recently. And of my published works, it's garnering the most citations. And so I wanted to try and summarize what radical social constructivism means for counseling, psychology, and education, and to basically define it. So this is kind of an introductory lecture, <clears throat> and I'll try to keep this to about 45 or 50 minutes. And I hope that through this um, lecture and PowerPoint, you'll gain a, a basic understanding of the model and have some understanding of how this applies uh, to work in counseling, psychology, and education. So I want to introduce um, social constructivism to you, and it really requires a shift in perspective. Most people in counseling and psychology and even in education have been trained primarily in what I would call a psychological paradigm where we look at the psychology of individuals and we try to assess them, understand them, teach them as individuals. But social constructivism shifts our perspective to a purely relational worldview. So our understanding of the world, events and people derives basically from social heritage. Everything that is known is known through relationships. In fact, I have five children and every word that they were taught as little children, um, those words were taught through relationships as my wife and I would train them, you know, teach them. Uh, we would, uh, from the very beginning, when they're in, in high chairs eating, we would put a little bit of banana on their lip and say banana. We would teach them about Cheerios and all kinds of different things that reflect our culture and our understanding of the world. So every word in our vocabulary is transmitted through other people, even concepts, and this is significant, like free will and free choice are culturally transmitted concepts. We see this in American culture in our movies. We see it with characters like the Maverick and Indiana Jones and Rooster Cogburn and the Batman all of these people appear to be rogues or individuals that are operating sometimes against prevailing wisdom, but still come out for the better. Um, but from a constructivist standpoint, there really is no individual psychology at work here. There's always relationships. So the psychology of the individual is superseded. All understanding of human behavior can be based on assessment of biological and social forces or factors. Basically what we're saying is that we're biologically predisposed to fit within social context and that we're very, very social animals. So all behavior is understood as biologically and socially compelled. The psychology of the individual becomes excess baggage of sorts. It really doesn't add to the explanatory framework. And um, so we find that concepts like mind and self and personality and intelligence, these aren't things unto themselves. These are basically socially constructed terms. For instance, take the concept of motivation, which is viewed as an individual psychological trait in many people. From a constructivist standpoint, motivation really resides in the network. So you might have a child who appears to be the least motivated student in the classroom. But on the playing field, the athletic playing field, that child might be the most motivated player. The drug pusher might be very motivated when out on the street pushing drugs, but in some other context, that person may look to be very unmotivated, for instance, academically unmotivated. So we have to look at people in context, in certain contexts, people will appear to be motivated and it's not in the person motivation, it's in the context. This is 
the way social constructivists begin to look. Now, I, know, I want you to note here that we really are talking about biological and social because this model is very biosocial. And, uh, you know, we, we really look at biological relationships as well as social relationships. The basic underlying philosophy here is what I call relational realism. Um, the world is assumed to be fully relationship. No thanks, just relationship. Everything that we view as a perceptual phenomenon for the transmission of relationship. And so we basically try to deconstruct things that we see. Um, when you look at me, I'm basically a, a conduit, a representation of my parents' biological relationship. They made it and I was produced. And I represent their physical biological relationship as I sit before you. But I also, since the time I was an infant, was very socially affected and brought up in a social context. All the words that I learned were communicated to me by my parents and others in my social network. And so when you look at me, you actually see a biological relationship, my parents' relationship, that was raised and um, formed in a social relational context or social matrix. So we look at people in this way. We don't look at people as things. We tend to try and look at them as um, biological relationships that are affected in social context. And we want to analyze both the biological and the social factors that may be influencing a client. So what is radical about radical social constructivism? <clears throat> well, uh, from the prior discussion there, you learn we haven't talked about psychology. There really is no psychology of the individual. Um, some constructivist thinkers try to focus on the individual and try to find social forces that are affecting an individual. But with radical social constructivism, there really isn't an individual self. There isn't an individual mind. Mind is in the matrix and decision making is in the social context. I developed a social constructivism model of ethical decision making and counseling and I attempted to show through that work uh, that was published in 2001 that decision making really doesn't happen in the head. It happens in the flurry of social activity that surrounds a decision. So um, basically we're saying that the mind is not in the head in a psychological sense. And so where do radical social constructivists identify the mind? Where is it? Um, well, the person who first began to address these kinds of issues, at least as far as I know, uh, was the anthropologist Gregory Bateson, who was viewed as a purist systems and relational theorist. Not only was he a relational epistemologist, meaning that he studied relationships, but he was in a, a relational, what I would call a relational ontologist, meaning that he believed that relationships were the stuff of the universe. And so here's a quote from Gregory Bateson. Quote, the mental characteristics of the system are imminent not in some part, but in the system as a whole. Or in other words, mind is in the social ecology. Look at the title of his book, Steps to an Ecology of Mind. Taking steps to move to an understanding that our mind is not in the head, but is in the social ecology. This is groundbreaking work, and he wrote this stuff uh, from the 1950s through the 1970s. Another um, author that has influenced me greatly is Kenneth Gergen, the social psychologist. Um, Gergen calls his work social constructionism. So it's a little different than radical social constructivism. And um, he published the work in 1985, The Social Constructionist Movement in Modern Psychology is the title of that article. It was in the American Psychologist. And uh, Gergen's quotes are very beautiful and um, clearly relate to what I'm talking about here in terms of 
where it is that we think. So he says knowledge is not something people possess somewhere in their head, but rather something people do together. And then another quote that I've used many times in my works is, the mind becomes a form of social myth. The self-concept is removed from the head and placed within the sphere of social discourse. So Gergen um, is one of my heroes and um, his work I use quite a lot. Now, some people ask, what is the difference between my so radical social constructivism and Gergen's social constructionism? And the difference really is twofold. First, he doesn't really address reality. He skirts the issue and doesn't feel that it's really relevant to his discussion. And so I take a different stand. I take the relational realism stand, the stand that uh, relationships are the stuff of the universe, much like Bateson. And so I do take a stand that relationships are everything and everything is a relationship. And the second point of difference is that I ground my work in the biology of cognition. And the works of Umberto Maturana, who you see pictured here, are significant in that regard. So uh, Maturana basically studied how it is that animals and humans operate perceptually. And he came to the conclusion that humans basically operate uh, in a way that they're wired to consensualize. And he called the process of consensualizing in a social realm, the consensual domain. So he proposes that the humans are biologically wired to come to consensus. And so my work <clears throat> is grounded um, in the biology of cognition. So big picture, what is it that we construct? Some people say, well, we socially construct reality. And uh, I used to say that earlier in my works, but I've gotten away from the reality term. We, we assume that reality is relationships. And that's about as far as we go. We really don't socially construct reality, but what we socially construct, and this is important, we socially construct our understanding of shared experience. I'm gonna say that again, because that's a critical key here. We socially construct our understanding of shared experience. So what, it, what this is saying is that our understanding is created and bounded through communication within our social networks. And uh, Madarana used a term called objectivity in parentheses to kind of uh, reflect this kind of thinking. So we don't have a pure objectivity and we have no pure subjectivity in this model. That's a continuum, objectivity to subjectivity. But we're off that continuum. I like to think that we're off it in a triadic position. And when I was reading Madarana's works, I tried to come up with an image that would reflect his thinking. And I came up with this little triadic diagram here. And I think this diagram kind of represents the ideas behind radical social constructivism. So you see down here at the bottom, there is the continuum objectivity and subjectivity. Objectivity, all things could be known by all people the same way. Subjectivity is that each individual has his or her own understanding of whatever it is is experienced. And objectivity in parentheses, you see the little parentheses here around the word objectivity represent the social boundaries within which people come to understand and agree about their experiences. So this is what Madarana called objectivity in parentheses, and it's off. The, the, the continuum of objectivity and subjectivity in a triadic position. And people really have to understand that. A lot of people try to locate constructivism, constructionism, or any of these models um, down here on this continuum and maybe closer to a subjectivity. But really, I believe it's off the continuum in a third place, triadic to objectivity and subjectivity. Now, subjectivity was hard for me to give up. I mean, I could understand 
uh, objectivity was questionable. We have, you know, uh, people that hold the truths that are really different, and you say, well, it's not objectively true, it's debatable. <clears throat> but I always held that, you know, if I could hold the truth unto myself, that it was my truth, me, myself, and I, you know, were raised in the psychological tradition, generally, in American culture. And so, um, you know, truth unto oneself is a kind of subjectivity. And the works that really challenged this for me were the works of Kenneth Gergen. Uh, Gergen came to the conclusion that there is no private language, and he cited the German philosopher Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein basically said that language is a convention, and that means that language is social. And so you can't be in subjectivity when you're in language because language is socially transmitted and socially grounded. So there is no private language. It's an interesting thought and uh, something to reflect on. All language, if it's meaningful, it has to be interactive. So we don't have subjectivity. We don't have objectivity. Um, we have something different than objectivity. So this is basically saying that in bounded objectivity, in Maturana's concept, bracket, excuse me, of uh, objectivity in parentheses, there are truths that are housed within a community of believers, so to speak. Um, people in the relationship tend to come to agreement about what it is they experience and that becomes real to them. So you see at the bottom of the slide, I have a little note to myself, fruit bowl example. So let me tell the fruit bowl example, which I use in my classes and students say that it helps. Consider a group of people in an office in a conference room and in the conference room, there's a large conference table. In the middle of the conference table, there's a bowl of fruit. So one of the conferees says, wow, I'm really hungry. Is that fruit for public consumption? And another person says, well, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. In fact, is it even real fruit? And another person says, what do you mean? You think it's decorative? And another person says, yes, it might be decorative. So one of the conferees picks up banana off the top of the fruit, squeezes it, and he says, oh my goodness, this is rubberized, decorative fruit. And they all begin to pass the fruit around. They realize it's not real in the sense of edible fruit, but it is rubberized, decorative fruit. And to them, they come to this conclusion because the concept of rubberized, decorative fruit is in their culture. It is something that can be understood. And so they share both the perceptual experience, but they also, in the language of their culture, come to a conclusion that represents their understanding of that experience. Now, if you take that fruit bowl and remove it and put it into, say, a native culture where they don't have any concept of rubberized decorative fruit, and you put it around the native people and watch what happens, and I would surmise that what would probably happen is they would approach the fruit bowl. They might approach it cautiously. Um, someone might uh, actually grab a piece of the fruit <coughs> and realize that this is not fruit like they understand fruit. They might begin to pass it around and experience the fruit. They probably won't come to the conclusion it's rubberized decorative fruit because they don't have any concept of that. But it may be that they'll come to some conclusion that this is something like a threat or a hoax or something that potentially is dangerous, a trap. And so for them, this experience leads to a conclusion that, for instance, this is a trap, a hoax. And for them, their understanding of their experience together is quite different <clears throat> than the understanding of the people that were in the conference. So for them, the fruit bowl means something totally different than for the people in the conference room. Now, one of the things that helped me to get this and to understand constructivism was religion. Religion really helped me to get the idea of the power of agreed upon fruits. 
So there are many religions in the world, and each group of adherents believes within the confines of their religious community the truths of their faith. So each group has a truth claim. And the, the, the believers hold that this is absolutely true. So um, I think the thing that was the aha moment for me, the one that really solidified this, <clears throat> was in um, 1997 when I studied the cult called Heaven Gate. It was a mass suicide in 1997. 39 people died. Uh, and they did it through consuming a poisonous concoction, presumably to have their souls rise up to the next level, which they defined as heaven of sorts. As the Halley Bach apparently was being followed by a spaceship that was charged with recycling the earth, which meant it was essentially going to clear the earth of humanity. Now, that seemed bizarre to me. But the people in this group tell this to be true. You don't kill yourself for a relative truth. To them, this was indisputable. That's what I mean by absolute truth. It was an indisputable truth. It was not a kill themselves if it was disputable. And so apparently there was no coercion in this example. And the people committed mass suicide. And they believed strongly in this conclusion, which to me seemed rather bizarre. And so I came up with the concept of bracketed absolute truth. Again, absolute meaning indisputable. Outsiders might find what people of another community believe to be outlandish or abhorrent, but the people in the community, and this is the trick, the truths are viewed as indisputable truths. Now, I developed another triadic diagram, and in this case, I talk about truth making. And so down here at the bottom, you see universal truth. This would be a truth that is known to all of us the same way, would be um, indisputable to everyone. Then you have over here individual relative truth, the truth that is real to one person and only to one person and is owned by the individual. And then you have the brackets up here around absolute truth, meaning that this truth is indisputable within the brackets of the social community that holds the truth. So I call it bracketed absolute truth. Again, uh, absolute reflects the concept of indisputable. It does not mean universal. Here's universal truth, it means indisputable truth within a community. So adherents to certain religions hold their truth to be absolute or indisputable. There's a God, but there's a heaven, a mana, a paradise. Such terms are given meaning within the boundaries of the religious community. They are viewed as absolutely true or indisputable by adherents. They're not universal truths. Madharani used a term that I really like. He said, we live in a world that's a multiverse rather than a universe, which means that there are any number of group truths um, that are indisputable to group members. As long as there are two people agreeing, there can be a truth claim. <clears throat> and even with the leaders of religions, we find that they often don't come to these ideas alone. They come to these ideas uh, in relationships with others. Of course, their historical community has much influence over the truth claim. But then in the end, there's usually another person, at least one, that agrees and helps to support the consensus that it arrives um, by the truth maker. Jesus had John the Baptist, for example. So truth is not relative, truths are not universal, they are bracketed absolutes. People come to believe truth through their communities. Now, if you have an interest in religion, I did write a book on applying social constructivist thought to religion. And so this is the book toward a positive psychology of religion. 
and I hope that you'll take a look at this book. It is a good primer on the ideas that you're learning here. And of course, if you have an interest in religion, it addresses many religious issues. But like the counseling, psychology, and education, what social constructivism teaches us is that relationships are very, very powerful. And what we understand comes through relationships. And when there are conflicts, there are conflicts of truths. When we have interpersonal conflicts, we have conflicts of truths. I use a few of the terms I have in the writing that I've done to represent bracketed truths. I call them pockets of objectivity. Um, consensuality is a term I use a lot. Uh, and then the one that I like best probably is communities of understanding, where people come to communities of understanding. So one of the questions you might have is consensualizing. How is it that we do this? <clears throat> it's an interpersonal process. In 1992, when I was writing about this, I came up with this definition, and I think this definition holds today. So consensus must not be viewed solely as a form of language-based activity. Consensus is probably best understood by the actions of individuals as they relate mutually, verbally, and non-verbally within certain interpersonal contexts. So that's the definition. It's not just language, but it's language and action. So we actually coordinate our activity around a belief. So when people are unable to coordinate their activity around belief, when they're unable to agree or act in accordance with an agreement, then there's a lack of consensus. In fact, problems between people tend to be conflicts of consensualities or two completing, excuse me, two competing socially supported views. Another example I use in my classes that students like is the case of the drug abusing teenager. For the teenager, the use of drugs in the community, teenagers, is considered acceptable, fun, stimulating, and the thing to do. So with his friends, and there's full agreement that smoking dope is acceptable. But for his drug prohibitionist family, there is clear agreement that drugs are bad. His mother and father are in agreement that drugs may be dangerous for their son's health and they put him in contact with an unhealthy group of people, the drug culture. They fear for his safety. So what you have in this scenario, you have the teenager who is a constructive truth and uh, parents who have a constructive truth, both about substance abuse. These are mutually exclusive and non-intersecting truths. Um, there is a conflict of consensualities, two competing views with two diverse communities of understanding. Now, these conflicting views didn't arise spontaneously in the heads of the involved individuals. They evolved through their social interactions and social groups of significance. And in fact, for instance, the teenagers, they were bright kids, for example, and maybe research to marijuana, for instance, and um, it isn't all that harmful, but the parents too could have come to some agreement, maybe researched marijuana and found that it could be a little damaging to the teenage brain and might affect motivation. And, and so um, these views tend to be supported through communication with others and they evolve as a consensual process. So conflicts can manifest themselves among family members, between partners or spouses. They may present an individual therapy. It's probably by low, like low self-esteem or anxiety. Here is a very important consideration. Relationships are always involved. Truths may be personal, religious, academic, or political as examples, but relationships are always involved. When I first started doing psychotherapy, I was trained to focus on the individual, to find the traits of the individual, and to locate the issue in the individual and the person's weak ego or poor self-concept as examples. Now I locate problems within relationships and I listen to my clients and my clients almost across the board will describe a problem that was relational currently or in the past. So 
They often will talk about their lovers, friends, family members, parents, children, etc., and they will describe problems in those relationships. They may describe a problem from the past. Maybe they were abused physically, emotionally, sexually. That's damaging to people. Relationships are potent at affecting mental health. And the corollary of the fact that relationships affect mental health negatively, that we can be harmed by relationships, is that we can be healed by relationships. Healing through a therapeutic relationship represents what we do as mental health professionals. So if we can be harmed by relationships, we can be healed by relationships. Basic premise of any kind of psychotherapy or mental health work that uh, applies radical social constructivist ideals. Now, negotiation is an important part of that work. <clears throat> it's the first step in trying to resolve disagreements, to educate and bring new ideas to the fore. Counselors and educators must be experts in negotiating truth by supporting or challenging any existing truths or defining new ones. Negotiation. Uh, is defined here. It involves discussion or even debate around conflicts or challenging new ideas as options for settlement or new understanding are presented and discussed. Negotiation assumes some level of disagreement or a knowledge gap between at least two intersecting individuals. If negotiation succeeds, there is consensualizing around an issue and agreement or a new way to understand shared experience is presented. So we want to facilitate ethical consensualities. We are, uh, in most cases, licensed professionals, counselors, psychologists, certified teachers. And um, we have to be careful um, that we don't go up against a, for instance, um, just law. Laws are created consensually through the legislature. Uh, in many cases, laws do serve us well. And uh, for instance, in the case of the teenager addict, we can't come to agreement that he can use drugs if drug use by teenagers is illegal in the jurisdiction. So there are legal constraints about what we can consensualize to, what we can agree to. And that's because of the larger social legal consensus within which we operate in. And so we try to come to consensus in a way that does not challenge and just law or an ethic that is produced, for instance, in a code of ethics for counselors or psychologists. <clears throat> Here's another example where two people disagree and there is no corroborating evidence. Um, consider a couple where one partner has been accused of, by the other of having an affair. There's no evidence from a third party that an affair has occurred. It could be the case of a shrewd cheat or an overly suspicious partner. If each is unyielding and defining his or her stance, the therapist would first ask, who agrees with you? Trying to find out the social context of the point of view. Now, typically people do talk to others. You might talk to your parents, you might talk to your friends, and talk about a certain circumstance uh, involving another person and come to agreement about that other person. But if there are situations where there's actually no verifying source, um, then it gets a little tricky, as in this case, particularly of the true chief or the overtly suspicious partner. The therapist, in this case, has to come up with a problem to solve. And so if uh, no uh, corroboration occurs on these truths that are claimed, then we have to begin to look at possibly the idea that disagreement between the couple is an issue or this lack of trust is an issue. Now, therapy will proceed from some consensus like that. And the radical social constructivist would focus on the need to develop a consensus about the nature of the problem and then how it is to be solved. So consensus building is critical. You might use a reframe to define the problem as a lack of trust or a lack of agreement. Now, typically, in situations where you're doing counseling around issues like this, time is critical because typically 
um, one of the two claims will uh, become credible through another source in time until suspiciousness will become apparent or there might be um, evidence of infidelity that is manifest or comes forth. The veracity of a truth claim lies in its enduring application of surviving in the relations. So veracity of truth claim isn't in the truth claim. It lies in its enduring application of surviving human relations. This is how we define veracity in radical social constructivism. So some truth claims will be challenged and replaced, like Einstein's physics versus Newton's physics, and others will persist and exist largely unchanged like the Ten Commandments of the Jewish people, which have been in place for millennia. So it's hard to claim that truth claims are arbitrary when we have examples like the Jewish Ten Commandments, which have been in place for millennia. This is not arbitrary. Some people say, well, you know, it's arbitrary. Every group has its own truth and it's arbitrary. No, some of these truths are held for very long periods of time and um, gain veracity through application to human relations that survive and thrive. So we don't call this something that's arbitrary because these truths can last for a long, long time. Now, the process of counseling is fully interactive. Counselors interact with clients to probe their concerns, to find agreements, disagreements, and to build consensual positions. Radical social constructivism in uh, counseling or education is similar in many ways, but there's a concept that needs to be described that relates to education. So Umberto Maturana came up with the concept of instructive interaction. Instructive interaction is where you teach something and the person who is the student or learner understands it exactly as the teacher understands it. Madarana said, there is no instructive interaction, meaning that you cannot transmit knowledge exactly as you understand it and expect that others will understand it in the same way. So instruction does not involve imparting knowledge as it is known by the instructor. Because Maturana says neurologically, we're closed systems. We're, we're closed informational systems. We're not closed thermodynamic systems. We can be frozen or burned. But from a neurological standpoint, we're closed informational systems. <clears throat> we can only experience what our biological wiring will allow. And each person's biology is similar to others, but not identical. So Maturana concludes that all human experience is internal experience. He called this structured determinism. We are closed to any objective outside world. Very important concept. We're closed to any objective outside world. Maturana uses a finger press experiment. And I'm going to take this from him and ask that you follow my lead here. Take your index finger and press it against the heart. Press hard against the surface and roll your finger around and um, don't hurt yourself, but do it until you feel some discomfort. Press hard against your finger until you feel some discomfort. And Madarana would then ask, can you feel the surface? And his answer is no, you cannot feel the surface. You can never feel the surface. What you actually feel is your bone against your nerve endings in your skin in your finger. What you're actually feeling is your bone against your nerve endings in your finger. And so if you raise your finger up like I did, you still may feel the same sensation, but you're not touching anything. So he's saying that you can never know an outside objective world because we're structured determined. Our nervous systems are closed informational systems. And what we feel <clears throat> is internal to our nervous system. What you see on the screen right now is not out there. It's on your retina. I'm on your retina. And so you experience me as you can 
by nature of your retina. If you have macular degeneration or some kind of visual problem, you might see me differently than someone else. And what you hear is the activity of your inner ear mechanism. You don't hear my voice, but you actually hear the vibration of your inner ear mechanism. So the only way we can learn is through what Madarana calls perturbation. He said, basically, we are simultaneously perceptually and socially perturbed. This is a very, a very critical concept, simultaneity. We are simultaneously perceptually and socially perturbed. Our nervous systems are rich biological systems. Our brain has billions of nerve cells. And we can be stimulated. Our brain can be active in two places. We can be stimulated in the visual cortex and we can be stimulated in the auditory area of the brain. So we can see things and hear things as examples at the same time. And so we can visually experience or perceptually experience something and talk about it at the same time. And that means we're simultaneously being perceptually and socially perturbed. And this is the context. This is the context for consensualizing. This is the biological context for consensualizing. So the human nervous system is rich. And here I have a little visual to describe our brains. And um, according to Madarana, there's simultaneous perturbation across the five senses, we can be visually and auditorially perturbed at the same time. This provides a physiological basis for consensus. Now, basically, we're wired to consensualize. And in education, it requires perceptual and interpretive stimuli simultaneously to perturb the nervous system both at the perception and social levels. I'm doing that in this presentation. I have a visual presentation. I'm on the screen and the PowerPoint's on the screen, but you're also hearing my voice at the same time as I begin to try to relay these ideas to you, which you will accept to some degree based on your past experiences. So the role of the counselor psychology educator is to oftentimes teach new ideas by providing the right combination of perceptual and social stimulation simultaneously. And of course, any constraint on content would be imposed consensually through just laws or consensual ethics. <clears throat> the professional role then is to present a new point of view. Students may not learn the new material exactly as the instructor knows it, but they may get an understanding of their shared experience that allows for understanding the new or different material. Now, a couple of techniques. I'll just go through a few big ones um, that are used uh, when we do any kind of therapy, counseling, psychology, or even education. We first try to get a person's understanding of their truth claim, and then we ask questions. Who agrees with you? Who do you think is on your side? Who disagrees with you? When I have a client who comes in and says they're depressed, I say, who depresses you? Um, who can lift you from your depression? Where did you learn the concept of depression? Who taught you the word depression? And what does it mean to you? Uh, and so I will ask a thousand questions that will place the concept of depression in a social context. And I will do therapy and that really relates to the social connection. It's trying to help the person come to a place that is a healthy place within which the person can thrive and survive. So we try to build a consensus. Um, counselors help to perceive and label experiences as consistent with mental health or new learning material. So building consensus is is very big. We probe consensus and then we build consensus, oftentimes building new ideas. We challenge consensus. If there is an uncomfortable understanding, something that could, could potentially be damaging, a truth claim that is a, a problematic, then we can challenge the consensus. And it often involves presenting alternative positions. The people must come to perceive and understand linguistically 
and perceptually. So we use things like bibliotherapy, movies, field trips, interviews, group involvement, groups of people that will hold a different position or communicate a different sense, lectures, evidence. And you think about lawyers, what lawyers do with juries. They're communicating a message as they're presenting evidence, and evidence is often uh, perceptual when it's presented to the jury members. Reframing is the most universal concept in all of psychotherapy. It's in every approach, and it's no different here. Reframing is a great thing, trying to define and experience a new way of approach so that a different consensus can be achieved. Now, I hope I, I have a whole list of other techniques. I have a chapter in my theories of counseling and psychotherapy text, which is uh, presented here, 2017 book. And um, I have a chapter called Cognitive Consensual Therapy. And in that chapter, I list uh, a great number of techniques that can be applied to this kind of work in mental health. And that book is a Springer book. And I have it listed in the reference list, which will go through very briefly at the end here. So conclusion, radical social constructivism offers counselors, psychologists, and educators a different perspective. It allows a fully contextualized definition of problems. It uses the power of relationships in both problem definition and identification of solutions. It focuses on the power of relationships and building truths that can help to survive and to achieve. One last question that I often get is, well, are you holding this out to be the truth? that it is the one and only way that humans operate. And I'm not, that would be hypocritical. And in fact, there are competitor views um, that are well-known competitor views to radical social constructivism. One would be uh, logical positivism, where people do attempt to find the truth through scientific methods. Logical positivists hold that there are truths that are unique unto themselves, and that they can be learned and understood by human beings. And another competitor is phenomenology, which is about the subjective experience of the person who is the perceiver. And so phenomenology holds the truth or has individually. These are two competitor views to radical social constructivism. And you might say, and constructivists would say, that there is no one right view, um, but there are communities of believers. And depending on your community of belief, you will be either a logical positivist or radical social constructivist or a phenomenologist. And wherever you land, that's okay. It's just a different point of view. And whatever is most useful to you in terms of the work that you do would get traction. So there are competitor views. And so I'm going to close with a quote from Gergen. Quote, when individuals declare right and wrong in a given situation, they are only acting as local representatives for larger relationships in which they are enmeshed. Their relationships speak through them. I like this last sentence in this quote. Their relationships speak through them. And that's a very powerful quote that helps us to understand constructivist thought. So I have a list of references. I'm just going to scroll through these very slowly so that you can see these or refer back to these if you have a copy of this presentation. And um, starting with my 1992 book, Theories and Paradigms of Counseling and Psychotherapy. Back then, I called this contextualism, but I, I changed the name. By 2001, I was calling it social constructivism. There's the ethical decision-making model. And then uh, another article on decision making. <clears throat> There's the book on religion, 2011, for the positive psychology of religion. Uh, an ebook that I published to make this accessible very inexpensively um, was published through Smashwords at 19.99 a copy, and it's available online. Um, a couple of other articles here in my of my book on psychotherapy at the bottom, uh, and uh, my ethics text that's uh, got a 2022 copyright date. And some other authors, Bateson, of course, Gergen's famous article in the American Psychologist, Amadaran, one of his classic works, 
and an article by Stephen Southern of Maine that I'm very proud of. He did a great job. And it was published in the Family Journal in 2020. So here is my contact information, and I hope that you have enjoyed this presentation, learned from it, and feel free to communicate with me about these and other ideas. Thank you so much.